section sixty eight of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the origin of dante's inferno nearly six centuries have elapsed since the appearance of the great work of dante and the literary historians of italy are even now disputing respecting the origin of this poem singular in its nature and in its excellence in ascertaining a point so long inquired after and so keenly disputed it will rather increase our admiration than detract from the genius of this great poet and it will illustrate the useful principle that every great genius is influenced by the objects and the feelings which occupy his own times only differing from the race of his brothers by the magical force of his developments the light he sends forth over the world he often catches from the faint and unobserved spark which would die away and turn to nothing in another hand the divina commedia of dante is a visionary journey through the three realms of the after-life existence and though in the classical ardour of our poetical pilgrim he allows his conductor to be a pagan the scenes are those of monkish imagination the invention of a vision was the usual vehicle for religious instruction in his age it was adapted to the genius of the sleeping homer of a monastery and to the comprehension and even to the faith of the populace whose minds were then awake to these awful themes the mode of writing visions has been imperfectly detected by several modern inquirers it got into the fabliau of the jongleurs or provencal bards before the days of dante they had these visions or pilgrimages to hell the adventures were no doubt solemn to them but it seemed absurd to attribute the origin of a sublime poem to such inferior and to us even ludicrous inventions every one therefore found out some other origin of dante's inferno since they were resolved to have one in other works more congenial to its nature the description of a second life the melancholy or the glorified scenes of punishment or bliss with the animated shades of men who were no more had been opened to the italian bard by his favourite virgil and might have been suggested according to wharton by the somnium scipionis of cicero but the entire work of dante is gothic it is a picture of his times of his own ideas of the people about him nothing of classical antiquity resembles it and although the name of virgil is introduced into a christian hades it is assuredly not the roman for dante's virgil speaks and acts as the latin poet could never have done it is one of the absurdities of dante who like our shakespeare or like gothic architecture itself has many things which lead to nothing amidst their massive greatness had the italian and the french commentators who have troubled themselves on this occasion known the art which we have happily practised in this country of illustrating a great national bard by endeavouring to recover the contemporary writings and circumstances which were connected with his studies and his times they had long ere this discovered the real framework of the inferno within the last twenty years it had been rumoured that dante had borrowed or stolen his inferno from the vision of alberico which was written two centuries before his time the literary antiquary batari had discovered a manuscript of this vision of alberico and in haste made extracts of a startling nature they were well adapted to inflame the curiosity of those who are eager after anything new about something old it throws an air of erudition over the small talker who otherwise would care little about the original this was not the first time that the whole edifice of genius had been threatened by the motion of a remote earthquake but in these cases it usually happens that those early discoverers who can judge of a little part are in total blindness when they would decide on a whole 
a poisonous mildew seemed to have settled on the laurels of dante nor were we relieved from our constant inquiries till il signor abate Cancellieri at rome published in eighteen fourteen this much talked of manuscript and has now enabled us to see and to decide and even to add the present little article as an useful supplement true it is that dante must have read with equal attention and delight this authentic vision of alberico for it is given so we are assured by the whole monastery as it happened to their ancient brother when a boy many a striking and many a positive resemblance in the divina commedia has been pointed out and mr gary in his english version of dante so english that he makes dante speak in blank verse very much like dante in stanzas has observed that the reader will in these marked resemblances see enough to convince him that dante had read this singular work the truth is that the vision of alberico must not be considered as a singular work but on the contrary as the prevalent mode of composition in the monastic ages it has been ascertained that alberico was written in the twelfth century judging of the age of a manuscript by the writing i shall now preserve a vision which a french antiquary had long ago given merely with the design to show how the monks abused the simplicity of our gothic ancestors and with an utter want of taste for such inventions he deems the present one to be monstrous he has not told us the age in which it was written this vision however exhibits such complete scenes of the inferno of the great poet that the writer must have read dante or dante must have read this writer the manuscript with another of the same kind is in the king's library at paris and some future researcher may ascertain the age of these gothic compositions doubtless they will be found to belong to the age of alberico for they are alike stamped by the same dark and awful imagination the same depth of feeling the solitary genius of the monastery it may however be necessary to observe that these visions were merely a vehicle for popular instruction nor must we depend on the age of their composition by the names of the superstitious visionaries affixed to them they were the satires of the times the following elaborate views of some scenes in the inferno were composed by an honest monk who was dissatisfied with the bishops and took this covert means of pointing out how the neglect of their episcopal duties was punished in the after-life he had an equal quarrel with the feudal nobility for their oppressions and he even boldly ascended to the throne the vision of charles the bald of the places of punishment and the happiness of the just i charles by the gratuitous gift of god king of the germans roman patrician and likewise emperor of the franks on the holy night of sunday having performed the divine offices of matins returning to my bed to sleep a voice most terrible came to my ear charles thy spirit shall now issue from thy body thou shalt go and behold the judgments of god they shall serve thee only as presages and thy spirit shall again return shortly afterwards instantly was my spirit rapt and he who bore me away was a being of the most splendid whiteness he put into my hand a ball of thread which shed a blaze of light such as the comet darts when it is apparent he divided it and said to me take thou this thread and bind it strongly on the thumb of thy right hand and by this i will lead thee through the infernal labyrinth of punishments then going before me with velocity but always unwinding this luminous thread he conducted me into deep valleys filled with fires and wells inflamed blazing with all sorts of unctuous matter there i observed the prelates who had served my father and my ancestors although i trembled i still however inquired of them to learn the cause of their 
torments they answered we are the bishops of your father and your ancestors instead of uniting them and their people in peace and concord we sowed among them discord and were the kindlers of evil for this are we burning in these tartarean punishments we and other men slayers and devourers of rapine here also shall come your bishops and that crowd of satellites who surround you and who imitate the evil we have done and while i listened to them tremblingly i beheld the blackest demons flying with hooks of burning iron who would have caught the ball of thread which i held in my hand and have drawn it towards them but it darted such a reverberating light that they could not lay hold of the thread these demons when at my back hustled to precipitate me into those sulphurous pits but my conductor who carried the ball wound about my shoulder a double thread drawing me to him with such force that we ascended high mountains of flame from whence issued lakes and burning streams melting all kinds of metals there i found the souls of lords who had served my father and my brothers some plunged in up to the hair of their heads others to their chins others with half their bodies immersed these yelling cried to me it is for inflaming discontents with your father and your brothers and yourself to make war and spread murder and rapine eager for earthly spoils that we now suffer these torments in these rivers of boiling metal while i was timidly bending over their suffering i heard at my back the clamours of voices potentes potenter tormenta patientur the powerful suffer torments powerfully and i looked up and beheld on the shores boiling streams and ardent furnaces blazing with pitch and sulphur full of great dragons large scorpions and serpents of a strange species where also i saw some of my ancestors princes and my brothers also who said to me alas charles behold our heavy punishment for evil and for proud malignant counsels which in our realms and in thine we yielded to from the lust of dominion as i was grieving with their groans dragons hurried on who sought to devour me with throats open belching flame and sulphur but my leader trebled the thread over me at whose resplendent light these were overcome leading me then securely we descended into a great valley which on one side was dark except where lighted by ardent furnaces while the amenity of the other was so pleasant and splendid that i cannot describe it i turned however to the obscure and flaming side i beheld some kings of my race agonized in great and strange punishments and i thought how in an instant the huge black giants who in turmoil were working to set this whole valley into flames would have hurled me into these gulfs i still trembled when the luminous thread cheered my eyes and on the other side of the valley a light for a little while whitened gradually breaking i observed two fountains one whose waters had extreme heat the other more temperate and clear and two large vessels filled with these waters the luminous thread rested on one of the fervid waters where i saw my father louis covered to his thighs and though labouring in the anguish of bodily pain he spoke to me my son charles fear nothing i know that thy spirit shall return unto thy body and god has permitted thee to come here that thou mayest witness because of the sins i have committed the punishments i endure one day i am placed in the boiling bath of this large vessel and on another changed into that of more tempered waters this i owe to the prayers of st peter st denis st remy who are the patrons of our royal house but if by prayers and masses offerings and alms psalmody and vigils my faithful bishops and abbots and even all the ecclesiastical order assist me it will not be long before i am delivered from these boiling waters look on your left i looked and beheld two tons of boiling waters these are prepared for thee he said if thou wilt not be thy own corrector and do penance for thy crimes then i began to sink with horror but my guide perceiving the panic of my spirit said to me follow me to the right of the valley bright in the glorious light of paradise 
i had not long proceeded when amidst the most illustrious kings i beheld my uncle lotharius seated on a topaz of marvellous magnitude covered with a most precious diadem and beside him was his son louis like him crowned and seeing me he spake with a blandishment of air and a sweetness of voice charles my successor now the third in the roman empire approach i know that thou hast come to view these places of punishment where thy father and my brother groans to his destined hour but still to end by the intercession of the three saints the patrons of the kings and the people of france know that it will not be long ere thou shalt be dethroned and shortly after thou shalt die then louis turning towards me thy roman empire shall pass into the hands of louis the son of my daughter give him the sovereign authority and trust to his hands that ball of thread thou holdest directly i loosened it from the finger of my right hand to give the empire to his son this invested him with empire and he became brilliant with all light and at the same instant admirable to see my spirit greatly wearied and broken returned gliding into my body hence let all know whatever happen that louis the young possesses the roman empire destined by god and so the lord who reigneth over the living and the dead and whose kingdom endureth for ever and for aye will perform when he shall call me away to another life the french literary antiquaries judged of these visions with the mere nationality of their taste everything gothic with them is barbarous and they see nothing in the redeeming spirit of genius nor the secret purpose of these curious documents of the age the vision of charles the bald may be found in the ancient chronicles of st denis which were written under the eye of the abbe Suger, the learned and able minister of louis the young and which were certainly composed before the thirteenth century the learned writer of the fourth volume of the melange tire d'une grande bibliothèque who had as little taste for these mysterious visions as the other french critic apologizes for the venerable abbe suger's admission of such visions assuredly he says the abbe suger was too wise and too enlightened to believe in similar visions but if he suffered its insertion or if he inserted it himself in the chronicle of st denis it is because he felt that such a fable offered an excellent lesson to kings to ministers and bishops and it had been well if they had not had worse tales told them the latter part is as philosophical as the former is the reverse in these extraordinary productions of a gothic age we may assuredly discover dante but what are they more than the framework of his unimitated picture it is only this mechanical part of his sublime conceptions that we can pretend to have discovered other poets might have adopted these visions but we should have had no divina commedia mr gary has finally observed for these pretended origins of dante's genius although mr gary knew only the vision of alberico it is the scale of magnificence on which this conception was framed and the wonderful development of it in all its parts that may justly entitle our poet to rank among the few minds to whom the power of a great creative faculty can be ascribed milton might originally have sought the seminal hint of his great work from a sort of italian mystery in the words of dante himself poca fovia gran fiamma seconda il paradiso canto one from a small spark great flame hath risen carry after all dante has said in a letter i found the original of my hell in the world which we inhabit and he said a greater truth than some literary antiquaries can always comprehend footnote in the recent edition of dante by romani in four volumes quarto the last preserves the vision of alberico and a strange correspondence on its publication the resemblances in numerous passages are pointed out it is curious to observe that the good catholic abate cancellieri at first maintained the authenticity of the vision by alleging that similar revelations have not been unusual the cavaliere 
gerardi rossi attacked the whole as the crude legend of a boy who was only made the instrument of the monks and was either a liar or a parrot we may express our astonishment that at the present day a subject of mere literary inquiry should have been involved with the faith of the roman church cancellieri becomes at length submissive to the lively attacks of rossi and the editor gravely adds his conclusion which had nearly concluded nothing he discovers pictures sculptures and a mystery acted as well as visions in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries from which he imagines the inferno the purgatorio and the paradiso owe their first conception the originality of dante however is maintained on a right principle that the poet only employed the ideas and the materials which is found in his own country and his own times in the footnote end of section sixty eight section sixty nine of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli of a history of events which have not happened such a title might serve for a work of not incurious nor unphilosophical speculation which might enlarge our general views of human affairs and assist our comprehension of those events which are enrolled on the registers of history the scheme of providence is carrying oil sublunary events by means inscrutable to us a mighty maze but not without a plan some mortals have recently written history and lectures on history who presume to explain the great scene of human affairs affecting the same familiarity with the designs of providence as with the events which they compile from human authorities every party discovers in the events which at first were adverse to their own cause but finally terminate in their favour that providence had used a peculiar and particular interference this is a source of human error and intolerant prejudice the jesuit mariana exulting over the destruction of the kingdom and nation of the goths in spain observes that it was by a particular providence that out of their ashes might rise a new and holy spain to be the bulwark of the catholic religion and unquestionably he would have adduced as proofs of this holy spain the establishment of the inquisition and the dark idolatrous bigotry of that hoodwinked people but a protestant will not sympathize with the feelings of the jesuit yet the protestants too will discover particular providences and magnify human events into supernatural ones this custom has long prevailed among fanatics we have had books published by individuals of particular providences which as they imagined had fallen to their lot they are called passages of providence and one i recollect by a crack-brained puritan whose experience never went beyond his own neighbourhood but who having a very bad temper and many whom he considered his enemies wrote down all the misfortunes which happened to them as acts of particular providences and valued his blessedness on the efficacy of his curses without venturing to penetrate into the mysteries of the present order of human affairs and the great scheme of fatality or of accident it may be sufficiently evident to us that often on a single event revolve the fortunes of men and of nations an eminent writer has speculated on the defeat of charles the second at worcester as one of those events which most strikingly exemplify how much better events are disposed of by providence than they would be if the direction were left to the choice even of the best and the wisest men he proceeds to show that a royal victory must have been succeeded by other severe struggles 
and by different parties a civil war would have contained within itself another civil war one of the blessings of his defeat at worcester was that it left the commonwealth's men masters of the three kingdoms and afforded them full leisure to complete and perfect their own structure of government the experiment was fairly tried there was nothing from without to disturb the process it went on duly from change to change the close of this history is well known had the royalists obtained the victory at worcester the commonwealth party might have obstinately persisted that had their republic not been overthrown their free and liberal government would have diffused its universal happiness through the three kingdoms this idea is ingenious and might have been pursued in my proposed history of events which have not happened under the title of the battle of worcester won by charles the second the chapter however would have had a brighter close if the sovereign and the royalists had proved themselves better men than the knaves and fanatics of the commonwealth it is not for us to scrutinize into the ways of providence but if providence conducted charles the second to the throne it appears to have deserted him when there historians for a particular purpose have sometimes amused themselves with the detail of an event which did not happen a history of this kind we find in the ninth book of livy and it forms a digression where with his delightful copiousness he reasons on the probable consequences which would have ensued had alexander the great invaded italy some greek writers to raise the parthians to an equality with the romans had insinuated that the great name of this military monarch who was said never to have lost a battle would have intimidated the romans and would have checked their passion for universal dominion the patriotic livy disdaining that the glory of his nation which had never ceased from war for nearly eight hundred years should be put in competition with the career of a young conqueror which had scarcely lasted ten enters into a parallel of man with man general with general and victory with victory in the full charm of his imagination he brings alexander down into italy he invests him with all his virtues and dusks their lustre with all his defects he arranges the macedonian army while he exultingly shows five roman armies at that moment pursuing their conquests and he cautiously counts the numerous allies who would have combined their forces he even descends to compare the weapons and the modes of warfare of the macedonians with those of the romans livy as if he had caught a momentary panic at the first success which had probably attended alexander in his descent into italy brings forth the great commanders he would have had to encounter he compares alexander with each and at length terminates his fears and claims his triumph by discovering that the macedonians had but one alexander while the romans had several this beautiful digression in livy is a model for the narrative of an event which never happened the saracens from asia had spread into africa and at length possessed themselves of spain Ude, a discontented duke of guienne in france had been vanquished by charles martel who derived that humble but glorious surname from the event we are now to record charles had left ude the enjoyment of his dukedom provided that he held it as a fief from the crown but blind with ambition and avarice ude adopted a scheme which threw christianity itself as well as europe into a crisis of peril which has never since occurred by marrying a daughter with the mahometan emir he rashly began an intercourse with the ishmaelites one of whose favourite projects was to plant a formidable colony of their faith in france an army of four hundred thousand combatants as the chroniclers of the time affirm were seen descending into guienne possessing themselves in one day of his domains 
and ude soon discovered what sort of workman he had called to do that of which he himself was so incapable charles with equal courage and prudence beheld this heavy tempest bursting over his whole country and to remove the first cause of this national evil he reconciled the discontented ude and detached the duke from his fatal alliance but the saracens were fast advancing through terrain and had reached tours by the river lure abderam the chief of the saracens anticipated a triumph in the multitude of his infantry his cavalry and his camels exhibiting a military warfare unknown in france he spread out his mighty army to surround the french and to take them as it were in a net the appearance terrified and the magnificence astonished charles collecting his far inferior forces assured them that they had no other france than the spot they covered he had ordered that the city of tours should be closed on every frenchman unless he entered it victorious and he took care that every fugitive should be treated as an enemy by bodies of gendarmes whom he placed to watch at the wings of his army the combat was furious the astonished mahometan beheld his battalions defeated as he urged them on singly to the french who on that day had resolved to offer their lives as an immolation to their mother country ude on that day ardent to clear himself from the odium which he had incurred with desperate valour taking a wide compass attacked his new allies in the rear the camp of the mahometan was forced the shrieks of his women and children reached him from amidst the massacre terrified he saw his multitude shaken charles who beheld the light breaking through this dark cloud of men exclaimed to his countrymen my friends god has raised his banner and the unbelievers perish the mass of the saracens though broken could not fly their own multitude pressed themselves together and the christian sword mowed down the mahometans abderam was found dead in a vast heap unwounded stifled by his own multitude historians record that three hundred and sixty thousand saracens perished on la journée des tours but their fears and their joy probably magnified their enemies thus charles saved his own country and at that moment all the rest of europe from this deluge of people which had poured down from asia and africa every christian people returned a solemn thanksgiving and saluted their deliverer as the hammer of france but the saracens were not conquered charles did not even venture on their pursuit and a second invasion proved almost as terrifying army still poured down on army and it was long and after many dubious results that the saracens were rooted out of france such is the history of one of the most important events which has passed but that of an event which did not happen would be the result of this famous conflict had the mahometan power triumphed the mahometan dominion had predominated through europe the imagination is startled when it discovers how much depended on this invasion at a time when there existed no political state in europe no balance of power in one common tie of confederation a single battle and a single treason had before made the mahometan sovereigns of spain we see that the same events had nearly been repeated in france and had the crescent towered above the cross as every appearance promised to the saracenic hosts the least of our evils had now been that we should have worn turbans combed our beards instead of shaving them have beheld a more magnificent architecture than the grecian while the public mind had been bounded by the arts and literature of the moorish university of cordova one of the great revolutions of modern europe perhaps had not occurred had the personal feelings of luther been respected and had his personal interest been consulted 
Gicciardini, whose veracity we cannot suspect, has preserved a fact which proves how very nearly some important events which have taken place might not have happened. I transcribe the passage from his thirteenth book. Caesar, the Emperor Charles V, after he had given an hearing in the Diet of Worms to Martin Luther, and caused his opinions to be examined by a number of divines, who reported that his doctrine was erroneous and pernicious to the Christian religion, had, to gratify the pontiff, put him under the ban of the empire, which so terrified Martin that if the injurious and threatening words which were given him by Cardinal San Sisto, the apostolical legate, had not thrown him into the utmost despair, it is believed it would have been easy, by giving him some preferment, or providing for him some honourable way of living, to make him renounce his errors. By this we may infer that one of the true authors of the Reformation was this very apostolical legate, they had succeeded in terrifying Luther, but they were not satisfied till they had insulted him, and with such a temper as Luther's, the sense of personal insult would remove even that of terror. It would unquestionably survive it. Footnote. Michelet, in his life of Luther, says the Spanish soldiers mocked and loaded him with insults, on the evening of his last examination before the diet at Worms, on his leaving the town hall to return to his hostelry, he ceased to employ arguments after this, and when next day the Archbishop of Treves wished to renew them, he replied in the language of Scripture, If this work be of men, it will come to naught, but if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. End of footnote a similar proceeding with Franklin, from our ministers, is said to have produced the same effect with that political sage. What Guicciardini has told of Luther preserves the sentiment of the times. Charles V was so fully persuaded that he could have put down the Reformation, had he rid himself at once of the chief, that having granted Luther a safeguard to appear at the Council of Worms, in his last moments he repented, as of a sin, that having had Luther in his hands he suffered him to escape, for to have violated his faith with a heretic he held to be no crime. In the history of religion, human instruments have been permitted to be the great movers of its chief revolutions, and the most important events concerning national religions appear to have depended on the passions of individuals, and the circumstances of the time. Impure means have often produced the most glorious results, and this perhaps may be among the dispensations of providence." A similar transaction occurred in Europe and in Asia. The motives and conduct of Constantine the Great, in the alliance of the Christian faith with his government, are far more obvious than any one of those qualities with which the panegyric of Eusebius so vainly cloaks over the crimes and unchristian life of this polytheistical Christian. In adopting a new faith as a coup d'etat, and by investing the church with temporal power, at which Dante so indignantly exclaims, he founded the religion of Jesus, but corrupted its guardians. The same occurrence took place in France under Clovis. The fabulous religion of paganism was fast on its decline. Clovis had resolved to unite the four different principalities, which divided Gaul into one empire. In the midst of an important battle, as fortune hung doubtful between the parties, the pagan monarch invoked the god of his fair Christian queen, and obtained the victory. St. Remy found no difficulty in persuading Clovis, after the fortunate event, to adopt the Christian creed. Political reasons for some time suspended the king's open conversion. At length the Franks followed their sovereign to the baptismal fonts, According to Pasquier, Naudet, and other political writers, these recorded miracles. Footnote. The miracles of Clovis consisted of a shield, which was picked up after having fallen from the skies, the anointing oil, conveyed from heaven by a white dove in a phial, which, till the reign of Louis the Sixteenth, consecrated the kings of France, and the oriflamme, 
or standard with golden flames long suspended over the tomb of st denis which the french kings only raised over the tomb when their crown was in imminent peril no future king of france can be anointed with the saint ampoule or oil brought down to earth by a white dove in seventeen ninety four it was broken by some profane hand and antiquaries have since agreed that it was only an ancient lacrimatory end of footnote like those of constantine were but inventions to authorize the change of religion clovis used the new creed as a lever by whose machinery he would be enabled to crush the petty princes his neighbors and like constantine clovis sullied by crimes of as dark a dye obtained the title of the great had not the most capricious defender of the faith been influenced by the most violent of passions the reformation so feebly and so imperfectly begun and continued had possibly never freed england from the papal thraldom for gospel light first beamed from boleyn's eyes it is however a curious fact that when the fall of anne boleyn was decided on rome eagerly prepared a reunion with the papacy on terms too flattering for henry to have resisted it was only prevented taking place by an incident that no human foresight could have predicted the day succeeding the decapitation of anne boleyn witnessed the nuptials of henry with the protestant jane seymour this changed the whole policy the dispatch from rome came a day too late from such a near disaster the english reformation escaped the catholic ward in his singular hudibrastic poem of england's reformation in some odd rhymes has characterized it by a naivete which we are much too delicate to repeat the catholic writers censure philip for recalling the duke of alva from the netherlands according to these humane politicians the unsparing sword and the penal fires of this resolute captain had certainly accomplished the fate of the heretics for angry lions however numerous would find their numerical force diminished by gibbets and pit-holes we have lately been informed by a curious writer that protestantism once existed in spain and was actually extirpated at the moment by the crushing arm of the inquisition footnote this fact was probably quite unknown to us till it was given in the quarterly review volume twenty nine however the same event was going on in italy End of footnote according to these catholic politicians a great event in catholic history did not occur the spirit of catholicism predominant in a land of protestants from the spanish monarch failing to support alva in finishing what he had begun had the armada of spain safely landed with the benedictions of rome in england at a moment when our own fleet was short of gunpowder and at a time when the english catholics formed a powerful party in the nation we might now be going to mass after his immense conquests had gustavus adolphus not perished in the battle of lutzen where his genius obtained a glorious victory unquestionably a wonderful change had operated on the affairs of europe the protestant cause had balanced if not preponderated over the catholic interest and austria which appeared a sort of universal monarchy had seen her eagle's wings clipped but the antichrist as gustavus was called by the priests of spain and italy the saviour of protestantism as he is called by england and sweden whose death occasioned so many bonfires among the catholics that the spanish court interfered lest fuel should become too scarce at the approaching winter gustavus fell the fit hero for one of those great events which have never happened on the first publication of the icon basilique of charles i the instantaneous effect produced on the nation was such fifty editions it is said appearing in one year that mr malcolm lang observes that had this book a sacred volume to those who considered that sovereign as a martyr appeared a week sooner it might have preserved the king 
and possibly have produced a reaction of popular feeling the chivalrous dundee made an offer to james the second which had it been acted on mr lang acknowledges might have produced another change what then had become of our glorious revolution which from its earliest step throughout the reign of william was still vacillating amidst the unstable opinions and contending interests of so many of its first movers the great political error of cromwell is acknowledged by all parties to have been the adoption of the french interest in preference to the spanish a strict alliance with spain had preserved the balance of europe enriched the commercial industry of england and above all had checked the overgrowing power of the french government before cromwell had contributed to the predominance of the french power the french huguenots were of consequence enough to secure an indulgent treatment the parliament as elizabeth herself had formerly done considered so powerful a party in france as useful allies and anxious to extend the principles of the reformation and to further the suppression of popery the parliament had once listened to and had even commenced a treaty with deputies from bordeaux the purport of which was the assistance of the french huguenots in their scheme of forming themselves into a republic or independent state but cromwell on his usurpation not only overthrew the design but is believed to have betrayed it to mazarin what a change in the affairs of europe had cromwell adopted the spanish interest and assisted the french huguenots in becoming an independent state the revocation of the edict of nantes and the increase of the french dominion which so long afterwards disturbed the peace of europe were the consequence of this fatal error of cromwell's the independent state of the french huguenots and the reduction of ambitious france perhaps to a secondary european power had saved europe from the scourge of the french revolution the elegant pen of mr roscoe has lately afforded me another curious sketch of a history of events which have not happened monsieur de sismondi imagines against the opinion of every historian that the death of lorenzo de medici was a matter of indifference to the prosperity of italy as he could not have prevented the different projects which had been matured in the french cabinet for the invasion and conquest of italy and therefore he concludes that all historians are mistaken who bestow on lorenzo the honour of having preserved the peace of italy because the great invasion that overthrew it did not take place till two years after his death mr roscoe has philosophically vindicated the honour which his hero has justly received by employing the principle which in this article has been developed the lorenzo de medici could not perhaps have prevented the important events that took place in other nations of europe it by no means follows that the life or death of lorenzo was equally indifferent to the affairs of italy or that circumstances would have been the same in case he had lived as in the event of his death mr roscoe then proceeds to show how lorenzo's prudent measures and proper representations might probably have prevented the french expedition which charles the eighth was frequently on the point of abandoning lorenzo would not certainly have taken the precipitate measures of his son piero in surrendering the florentine fortresses his family would not in consequence have been expelled the city a powerful mind might have influenced the discordant politics of the italian princes in one common defence a slight opposition to the fugitive army of france at the pass of ferro might have given the french sovereigns a wholesome lesson and prevented those bloody contests that were soon afterwards renewed in italy as a single remove at chess varies the whole game so the death of an individual of such importance in the affairs of europe as lorenzo de medici could not fail of producing such a change in its political relations as must have varied them in an incalculable degree pignotti also describes the state of italy at this time 
had lorenzo lived to have seen his son elevated to the papacy this historian adopting our present principle exclaims a happy era for italy and tuscany had then occurred on this head we can indeed be only allowed to conjecture but the fancy guided by reason may expatiate at will in this imaginary state and contemplate italy reunited by a stronger bond flourishing under its own institutions and arts and delivered from all those lamented struggles which occurred within so short a period of time whitaker in his vindication of mary queen of scots has a speculation in the true spirit of this article when such dependence was made upon elizabeth's dying without issue the countess of shrewsbury had her son purposely residing in london with two good and able horses continually ready to give the earliest intelligence of the sick elizabeth's death to the imprisoned mary on this the historian observes and had this not improbable event actually taken place what a different complexion would our history have assumed from what it wears at present mary would have been carried from a prison to a throne her wise conduct in prison would have been applauded by all from tutbury from sheffield and from chatsworth she would have been said to have touched with a gentle and masterly hand the springs that actuated all the nation against the death of her tyrannical cousin etc so ductile is history in the hands of man and so peculiarly does it bend to the force of success and warp with the warmth of prosperity thus important events have been nearly occurring which however did not take place and others have happened which may be traced to accident and to the character of an individual we shall enlarge our conception of the nature of human events and gather some useful instruction in our historical reading by pausing at intervals contemplating for a moment on certain events which have not happened End of section 69section 70 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli of false political reports a false report if believed during three days may be of great service to a government this political maxim has been ascribed to catherine de medici an adept in coup d'etat the arcana imperii between solid lying and disguised truth there is a difference known to writers skilled in the art of governing mankind by deceiving them as politics ill understood have been defined and as indeed all party politics are these forgers prefer to use the truth disguised to the gross fiction when the real truth can no longer be concealed then they can confidently refer to it for they can still explain and obscure while they secure on their side the party whose cause they have advocated a curious reader of history may discover the temporary and sometimes the lasting advantages of spreading rumours designed to disguise or to counteract the real state of things such reports set a-going serve to break down the sharp and fatal point of a panic which might instantly occur in this way the public is saved from the horrors of consternation and the stupefaction of despair these rumours give a breathing time to prepare for the disaster which is doled out cautiously and as might be shown in some cases these first reports have left an event in so ambiguous a state that a doubt may still arise whether these reports were really destitute of truth such reports once printed enter into history and sadly perplex the honest historian 
of a battle fought in a remote situation both parties for a long time at home may dispute the victory after the event and the pen may prolong what the sword had long decided this has been no unusual circumstance of several of the most important battles on which the fate of europe has hung were we to rely on some reports of the time we might still doubt of the manner of the transaction a skirmish has been often raised into an arranged battle and a defeat concealed in an account of the killed and wounded while victory has been claimed by both parties villeroy in all his encounters with marlborough always sent home dispatches by which no one could suspect that he was discomfited pompey after his fatal battle with caesar sent letters to all the provinces and cities of the romans describing with greater courage than he had fought so that a report generally prevailed that caesar had lost the battle plutarch informs us that three hundred writers had described the battle of marathon many doubtless had copied their predecessors but it would perhaps have surprised us to have observed how materially some differed in their narratives in looking over a collection of manuscript letters of the times of james i i was struck by the contradictory reports of the result of the famous battle of lutzen so glorious and so fatal to gustavus adolphus the victory was sometimes reported to have been obtained by the swedes but a general uncertainty a sort of mystery agitated the majority of the nation who were staunch to the protestant cause this state of anxious suspense lasted a considerable time the fatal truth gradually came out in reports changing in their progress if the victory was allowed the death of the protestant hero closed all hope the historian of gustavus adolphus observes on this occasion that few couriers were better received than those who conveyed the accounts of the king's death to declared enemies or concealed ill-wishers nor did the report greatly displease the court of whitehall where the ministry as it usually happens in cases of timidity had its degree of apprehensions for fear the event should not be true and as i have learnt from good authority imposed silence on the news-writers and intimated the same to the pulpit in case any funeral encomium might proceed from that quarter although the motive assigned by the writer that of the secret indisposition of the cabinet of james i towards the fortunes of gustavus is to me by no means certain unquestionably the knowledge of this disastrous event was long kept back by a timid ministry and the fluctuating reports probably regulated by their designs the same circumstance occurred on another important event in modern history where we may observe the artifice of party writers in disguising or suppressing the real fact this was the famous battle of the boyne the french catholic party long reported that count lauzun had won the battle and that william the third was killed bussy rabotin in some memoirs in which he appears to have registered public events without scrutinizing their truth says i chronicled this account according as the first reports gave out when at length the real fact reached them the party did not like to lose their pretended victory pere Londel, who published a register of the times which is favorably noticed in the nouvelle de la republique des lettres for sixteen ninety nine has recorded the event in this deceptive manner the battle of the boyne in ireland schomberg is killed there at the head of the english this is an equivocator the writer resolved to conceal the defeat of james's party and cautiously suppresses any mention of a victory but very carefully gives a real fact by which his readers would hardly doubt of the defeat of the english we are so accustomed to this traffic of false reports that we are scarcely aware that many important events recorded in history were in their day strangely disguised by such mystifying accounts this we can only discover by reading private letters written at the moment bayle has collected several remarkable absurdities of this kind which were spread abroad to answer a temporary purpose but which had never been known to us had these contemporary letters not been published a report was prevalent in holland in fifteen eighty 
that the kings of france and spain and the duke of alva were dead a felicity which for a time sustained the exhausted spirits of the revolutionists at the invasion of the spanish armada burleigh spread reports of the thumbscrews and other instruments of torture which the spaniards had brought with them and thus inflamed the hatred of the nation the horrid story of the bloody colonel kirk is considered as one of those political forgeries to serve the purpose of blackening a zealous partisan false reports are sometimes stratagems of war when the chiefs of the league had lost the battle at ivry with an army broken and discomfited they still kept possession of paris merely by imposing on the inhabitants all sorts of false reports such as the death of the king of navarre at the fortunate moment when victory undetermined on which side to incline turned for the leaguers and they gave out false reports of a number of victories they had elsewhere obtained such tales distributed in pamphlets and ballads among a people agitated by doubts and fears are gladly believed flattering their wishes or soothing their alarms they contribute to their ease and are too agreeable to allow time for reflection the history of a report creating a panic may be traced in the irish insurrection in the curious memoirs of james the second a forged proclamation of the prince of orange was set forth by one speak and a rumour spread that the irish troops were killing and burning in all parts of the kingdom a magic-like panic instantly ran through the people so that in one quarter of the town of drogheda they imagined that the other was filled with blood and ruin during this panic pregnant women miscarried aged persons died with terror while the truth was that the irish themselves were disarmed and dispersed in utter want of a meal or a lodging in the unhappy times of our civil wars under charles i the newspapers and the private letters afford specimens of this political contrivance of false reports of every species no extravagance of invention to spread a terror against a party was too gross and the city of london was one day alarmed that the royalists were occupied by a plan of blowing up the river thames by an immense quantity of powder warehoused at the riverside and that there existed an organized though invisible brotherhood of many thousands with consecrated knives and those who hesitated to give credit to such rumours were branded as malignants who took not the danger of the parliament to heart forged conspiracies and reports of great but distant victories were inventions to keep up the spirit of a party but oftener prognosticated some intended change in the government when they were desirous of augmenting the army or introducing new garrisons or using an extreme measure with the city or the royalists there was always a new conspiracy set afloat or when any great affair was to be carried in parliament letters of great victories were published to dishearten the opposition and infuse additional boldness in their own party if the report lasted only a few days it obtained its purpose and verified the observation of catherine de medici those politicians who raise such false reports obtain their end like the architect who in building an arch supports it with circular props and pieces of timber or any temporary rubbish till he closes the arch and when it can support itself he throws away the props there is no class of political lying which can want for illustration if we consult the records of our civil wars there we may trace the whole art in all the nice management of its shades its qualities and its more complicated parts from invective to puff and from innuendo to prevarication we may admire the scrupulous correction of a lie which they had told by another which they are telling and triple lying to overreach their opponents royalists and parliamentarians were alike for to tell one great truth the father of lies is of no party footnote one of the most absurd reports that ever frightened private society was that which prevailed in paris at the end of the seventeenth century it was that the jesuits used a poisoned snuff which they gave to their opponents with the fashionable politeness of the day in offering a pinch and which for a time deterred the custom End of footnote. 
as nothing is new under the sun so this art of deceiving the public was unquestionably practised among the ancients syphax sent scipio word that he could not unite with the romans but on the contrary had declared for the carthaginians the roman army were then anxiously waiting for his expected succours scipio was careful to show the utmost civility to these ambassadors and ostentatiously treated them with presents that his soldiers might believe they were only returning to hasten the army of syphax to join the romans livy censures the roman consul who after the defeat at cannae told the deputies of the allies the whole loss they had sustained this consul says livy by giving too faithful and open an account of his defeat made both himself and his army appear still more contemptible the result of the simplicity of the consul was that the allies despairing that the romans would ever recover their losses deemed it prudent to make terms with hannibal plutarch tells an amusing story in his way of the natural progress of a report which was contrary to the wishes of the government the unhappy reporter suffered punishment as long as the rumour prevailed though at last it proved true a stranger landing from sicily at a barber's shop delivered all the particulars of the defeat of the athenians of which however the people were yet uninformed the barber leaves untrimmed the reporter's beard and flies away to vent the news in the city where he told the archons what he had heard the whole city was thrown into a ferment the archons called an assembly of the people and produced the luckless barber who in confusion could not give any satisfactory account of the first reporter he was condemned as a spreader of false news and a disturber of the public quiet for the athenians could not imagine but that they were invincible the barber was dragged to the wheel and tortured till the disaster was more than confirmed bayle referring to this story observes that had the barber reported a victory though it had proved to be false he would not have been punished a shrewd observation which occurred to him from his recollection of the fate of stratocles this person persuaded the athenians to perform a public sacrifice and thanksgiving for a victory obtained at sea though he well knew at the time that the athenian fleet had been totally defeated when the calamity could no longer be concealed the people charged him with being an impostor but stratocles saved his life and mollified their anger by the pleasant turn he gave the whole affair have i done you any injury said he is it not owing to me that you have spent three days in the pleasures of victory i think that this spreader of good but fictitious news should have occupied the wheel of the luckless barber who had spread bad but true news for the barber had no intention of deception but stratocles had and the question here to be tried was not the truth or the falsity of the reports but whether the reporters intended to deceive their fellow-citizens the chronicle and the post must be challenged on such a jury and all the race of news scribes whom patin characterizes as hominum genus audacissimum mendacimum awidissimum latin superlatives are too rich to suffer a translation but what patin says in his letter three hundred and fifty six may be applied these writers insert in their papers things they do not know and ought not to write it is the same trick that is playing which was formerly played it is the very same farce only it is exhibited by new actors the worst circumstance i think in this is that this trick will continue playing a long course of years and that the public suffer a great deal too much by it End of section seventy. Section seventy one of Curiosities of Literature, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume two by Isaac Disraeli. Of Suppressors and Dilapidators of Manuscripts manuscripts are suppressed or destroyed from motives which require to be noticed 
plagiarists at least have the merit of preservation they may blush at their artifices and deserve the pillory but their practices do not incur the capital crime of felony serassi the writer of the curious life of tasso was guilty of an extraordinary suppression in his zeal for the poet's memory the story remains to be told for it is but little known galileo in early life was a lecturer at the university of pisa delighting in poetical studies he was then more of a critic than a philosopher and had ariosto by heart this great man caught the literary mania which broke out about his time when the cruscans so absurdly began their controversi tesesca and raised up two poetical factions which infected the italians with a national fever tasso and ariosto were perpetually weighed and outweighed against each other galileo wrote annotations on tasso stanza after stanza and without reserve treating the majestic bard with a severity which must have thrown the tassoists into an agony our critic lent his manuscript to jacopo mazzoni who probably being a disguised tassoist by some accountable means contrived that the manuscript should be absolutely lost to the deep regret of the author and all the ariostoists the philosopher descended to his grave not without occasional groans nor without exulting reminiscences of the blows he had in his youth inflicted on the great rival of ariosto and the rumour of such a work long floated on tradition two centuries had nearly elapsed when serassi employed on his elaborate life of tasso among his uninterrupted researches in the public libraries of rome discovered a miscellaneous volume in which on a cursory examination he found deposited the lost manuscript of galileo it was a shock from which perhaps the zealous biographer of tasso never fairly recovered the awful name of galileo sanctioned the asperity of critical decision and more particularly the severe remarks on the language a subject on which the italians are so morbidly delicate and so trivially grave serassi's conduct on this occasion was at once political timorous and cunning gladly would he have annihilated the original but this was impossible it was some consolation that the manuscript was totally unknown for having got mixed with others it had accidentally been passed over and not entered into the catalogue his own diligent eye only had detected its existence nessuno fin ora sa fuori di me se vi sia ne dove sia e cosi non potra darsi alio luce etc but in the true spirit of a collector avaricious of all things connected with his pursuit serassi cautiously but completely transcribed the precious manuscript with an intention according to his memorandum to unravel all its sophistry however although the abate never wanted leisure he persevered in his silence yet he often trembled lest some future explorer of manuscripts might be found as sharp-sighted as himself he was so cautious as not even to venture to note down the library where the manuscript was to be found and to this day no one appears to have fallen on the volume on the death of serassi his papers came to the hands of the duke of sari a lover of literature the transcript of the yet undiscovered original was then revealed and this secret history of the manuscript was drawn from a note on the title-page written by serassi himself to satisfy the urgent curiosity of the literati these annotations on tasso by galileo were published in seventeen ninety three here is a work which from its earliest stage much pains had been taken to suppress but serassi's collecting passion inducing him to preserve what he himself so much wished should never appear finally occasioned its publication it adds one evidence to the many which prove that such sinister practices have been frequently used by the historians of a party poetic or politic 
unquestionably this entire suppression of manuscripts has been too frequently practised it is suspected that our historical antiquary speed owed many obligations to the learned hugh broughton for he possessed a vast number of his manuscripts which he burnt why did he burn if persons place themselves in suspicious situations they must not complain if they be suspected we have had historians who whenever they met with information which has not suited their historical system or their inveterate prejudices have employed interpolations castrations and forgeries and in some cases have annihilated the entire document leland's invaluable manuscripts were left at his death in the confused state in which the mind of the writer had sunk overcome by his incessant labours when this royal antiquary was employed by henry the eighth to write our national antiquities his scattered manuscripts were long a common prey to many who never acknowledged their fountain-head among these suppressors and dilapidators pre-eminently stands the crafty italian polydori virgil who not only drew largely from this source but to cover the robbery did not omit to depreciate the father of our antiquities an act of a piece with the character of the man who is said to have collected and burnt a greater number of historical manuscripts than would have loaded a wagon to prevent the detection of the numerous fabrications in his history of england which was composed to gratify mary and the catholic cause the harleian manuscript seventy three seventy nine is a collection of state letters this manuscript has four leaves entirely torn out and is accompanied by this extraordinary memorandum signed by the principal librarian upon examination of this book november twelfth seventeen sixty four these four last leaves were torn out c morton mem memorandum november twelfth sent down to mrs macaulay as no memorandum of the name of any student to whom a manuscript is delivered for his researches was ever made before or since or in the nature of things will ever be this memorandum must involve our female historian in the obloquy of this dilapidation footnote it is now about thirty-seven years ago since i first published this anecdote at the same time i received information that our female historian and dilapidator had acted in this manner more than once at that distance of time this rumour so notorious at the british museum it was impossible to authenticate the rev william graham the surviving husband of mrs macaulay intemperately called on dr morton in a very advanced period of life to declare that it appeared to him that the note does not contain any evidence that the leaves were torn out by mrs macaulay it was more apparent to the unprejudiced that the doctor must have singularly lost the use of his memory when he could not explain his own official note which perhaps at the time he was compelled to insert dr morton was not unfriendly to mrs macaulay's political party he was the editor of whitelock's diary of his embassy to the queen of sweden and has i believe largely castrated the work the original lies at the british museum in the footnote such dishonest practices of party feeling indeed are not peculiar to any party in roscoe's illustrations of his life of lorenzo de medici we discover that fabroni whose character scarcely admits of suspicion appears to have known of the existence of an unpublished letter of sixtus the fourth which involves that pontiff deeply in the assassination projected by the pazzi but he carefully suppressed its notice yet in his conscience he could not avoid alluding to such documents which he concealed by his silence roscoe has apologized for fabroni overlooking this decisive evidence of the guilt of the hypocritical pontiff in the mass of manuscripts a circumstance not likely to have occurred however to this laborious historical inquirer all party feeling is the same active spirit with an opposite direction we
we have a remarkable case where a most interesting historical production has been silently annihilated by the consent of both parties there once existed an important diary of a very extraordinary character sir george saville afterwards marquis of halifax this master spirit for such i am inclined to consider the author of the little book of maxims and reflections with a philosophical indifference appears to have held in equal contempt all the factions of his times and consequently has often incurred their severe censures among other things the marquis of halifax had noted down the conversation he had had with charles the second and the great and busy characters of the age of this curious secret history there existed two copies and the noble writer imagined that by this means he had carefully secured their existence yet both copies were destroyed from opposite motives the one at the instigation of pope who was alarmed at finding some of the catholic intrigues of the court developed and the other at the suggestion of a noble friend who was equally shocked at discovering that his party the revolutionists had sometimes practised mean and dishonourable deceptions it is in these legacies of honourable men of whatever party they may be that we expect to find truth and sincerity but thus it happens that the last hope of posterity is frustrated by the artifices or the malignity of these party passions pulteney afterwards the earl of bath had also prepared memoirs of his times which he proposed to confide to dr douglas bishop of salisbury to be composed by the bishop but his lordship's heir the general insisted on destroying these authentic documents of the value of which we have a notion by one of those conversations which the earl was in the habit of indulging with hook whom he at that time appears to have intended for his historian the earl of anglesey's manuscript history of the troubles of ireland and also a diary of his own times have been suppressed a busy observer of his contemporaries his tale would materially have assisted a later historian the same hostility to manuscripts as may be easily imagined has occurred perhaps more frequently on the continent i shall furnish one considerable fact a french canon claude joly a bold and learned writer had finished an ample life of erasmus which included a history of the restoration of literature at the close of the fifteenth and the beginning of the sixteenth century colomier tells us that the author had read over the works of erasmus seven times we have positive evidence that the manuscript was finished for the press the cardinal du noailles would examine the work himself this important history was not only suppressed but the hope entertained of finding it among the cardinal's papers was never realized these are instances of the annihilation of history but there is a partial suppression or castration of passages equally fatal to the cause of truth a practice too prevalent among the first editors of memoirs by such deprivations of the text we have lost important truths while in some cases by interpolations we have been loaded with the fictions of a party original memoirs when published should now be deposited at that great institution consecrated to our national history the british museum to be verified at all times in lord herbert's history of henry the eighth i find by a manuscript note that several things were not permitted to be printed and that the original manuscript was supposed to be in mr sheldon's custody in sixteen eighty seven camden told sir robert Fillmore that he was not suffered to print all his annals of elizabeth but he providently sent these expurgated passages to de tu who printed them faithfully and it is remarkable that de tu himself used the same precaution in the continuation of his own history we like remote truths but truths too near us never fail to alarm ourselves our connections and our party 
milton in composing his history of england introduced in the third book a very remarkable digression on the characters of the long parliament a most animated description of a class of political adventurers with whom modern history has presented many parallels from tenderness to a party then imagined to be subdued it was struck out by command nor do i find it restituted by kennett's collection of english histories this admirable and exquisite delineation has been preserved in a pamphlet printed in sixteen eighty one which has fortunately exhibited one of the warmest pictures in design and colouring by a master's hand one of our most important volumes of secret history whitelock's memorials was published by arthur earl of anglesey in sixteen eighty two who took considerable liberties with the manuscript another edition appeared in seventeen thirty two which restored the many important passages through which the earl appears to have struck his castrating pen the restitution of the castrated passages has not much increased the magnitude of this folio volume for the omissions usually consisted of a characteristic stroke or short critical opinion which did not harmonize with the private feelings of the earl of anglesey in consequence of the volume not being much enlarged to the eye and being unaccompanied by a single line of preface to inform us of the value of this more complete edition the booksellers imagine that there can be no material difference between the two editions and wonder at the bibliopolical mystery that they can afford to sell the edition of sixteen eighty two at ten shillings and have five guineas for the edition of seventeen thirty two hume who i have been told wrote his history usually on a sofa with the epicurean indolence of his fine genius always refers to the old truncated and faithless edition of whitelock so little in his day did the critical history of books enter into the studies of authors or such was the carelessness of our historian there is more philosophy in editions than some philosophers are aware of perhaps most memoirs have been unfaithfully published curtailed of their fair proportions and not a few might be noticed which subsequent editors have restored to their original state by uniting their dislocated limbs unquestionably passion has sometimes annihilated manuscripts and tamely revenged itself on the papers of hated writers louis the fourteenth with his own hands after the death of fenelon burnt all the manuscripts which the duke of burgundy had preserved of his preceptor as an example of the suppressors and dilapidators of manuscripts i shall give an extraordinary fact concerning louis the fourteenth more in his favour his character appears like some other historical personages equally disguised by adulation and calumny that monarch was not the nero which his revocation of the edict of nantes made him seem to the french protestants he was far from approving of the violent measures of his catholic clergy this opinion of that sovereign was however carefully suppressed when his instructions to the dauphin were first published it is now ascertained that louis the fourteenth was for many years equally zealous and industrious and among other useful attempts composed an elaborate discours for the dauphin for his future conduct the king gave his manuscript to pelisson to revise but after the revision our royal writer frequently inserted additional paragraphs the work first appeared in an anonymous recuil d'aspuscule littéraire amsterdam seventeen sixty seven which barbier in his anonyme tells us was rédigé par pelisson le tout publié par l'abbé olivé when at length the printed work was collated with the manuscript original several suppressions of the royal sentiments appeared and the editors too catholic had with more particular caution thrown aside what clearly showed louis the fourteenth was far from approving of the violences used against the protestants the following passage was entirely omitted it seems to me my son 
that those who employ extreme and violent remedies do not know the nature of the evil occasioned in part by heated minds which left to themselves would insensibly be extinguished rather than rekindle them afresh by the force of contradiction above all when the corruption is not confined to a small number but diffused through all parts of the state besides the reformers said many true things the best method to have reduced little by little the huguenots of my kingdom was not to have pursued them by any direct severity pointed at them lady mary wortley montague is a remarkable instance of an author nearly lost to the nation she is only known to posterity by a chance publication for such were her famous turkish letters the manuscript of which her family once purchased with an intention to suppress but they were frustrated by a transcript the more recent letters were reluctantly extracted out of the family trunks and surrendered in exchange for certain family documents which had fallen into the hands of a bookseller had it depended on her relatives the name of lady mary had only reached us in the satires of pope the greater part of her epistolary correspondence was destroyed by her mother and what that good and gothic lady spared was suppressed by the hereditary austerity of rank of which her family was too susceptible the entire correspondence of this admirable writer and studious woman for once in perusing some unpublished letters of lady mary's i discovered that she had been in the habit of reading seven hours a day for many years would undoubtedly have exhibited a fine statue instead of the torso we now possess and we might have lived with her ladyship as we do with madame de sévigné this i have mentioned elsewhere but i have since discovered that a considerable correspondence of lady mary's for more than twenty years with the widow of colonel forrester who had retired to rome has been stifled in the birth these letters with other manuscripts of lady mary's were given by mrs forrester to philip thickness with a discretionary power to publish they were held as a great acquisition by thickness and his bookseller but when they had printed off the first thousand sheets there were parts which they considered might give pain to some of the family thickness says lady mary had in many places been uncommonly severe upon her husband for all her letters were loaded with a scrap or two of poetry at him Footnote. there was one passage he recollected just left my bed a lifeless trunk and scarce a dreaming head End of footnote. a negotiation took place with an agent of lord butte's after some time miss forrester put in her claims for the manuscripts and the whole terminated as thickness tells us in her obtaining a pension and lord butte all the manuscripts the late duke of bridgewater i am informed burnt many of the numerous family papers and bricked up a quantity which when opened after his death were found to have perished it is said he declared that he did not choose that his ancestors should be traced back to a person of a mean trade which it seems might possibly have been the case the loss now cannot be appreciated but unquestionably stores of history and perhaps of literature were sacrificed milton's manuscript of comus was published from the bridgewater collection for it had escaped the bricking up manuscripts of great interest are frequently suppressed from the shameful indifference of the possessors mr matthias in his essay on gray tells us that in addition to the valuable manuscripts of mr gray there is reason to think that there were some other papers folio sibylli in the possession of mr mason but though a very diligent and anxious inquiry has been made after them they cannot be discovered since his death there was however one fragment by mr mason's own description of it of very great value namely the plan of an intended speech in latin on his appointment as professor of modern history in the university of cambridge mr mason says immediately on his appointment mr gray sketched out an admirable plan for his inauguration speech in which after enumerating the preparatory and auxiliary studies requisite such as ancient history geography chronology etc 
he descended to the authentic sources of the science such as public treaties state records private correspondence of ambassadors etc he also wrote the exordium of this thesis not indeed so correct as to be given by way of fragment but so spirited in point of sentiment as leaves it much to be regretted that he did not proceed to its conclusion this fragment cannot now be found and after so very interesting a description of its value and of its importance it is difficult to conceive how mr mason could prevail upon himself to withhold it if there be a subject on which more perhaps than on any other it would have been peculiarly desirable to know and to follow the train of the ideas of gray it is that of modern history in which no man was more intimately more accurately or more extensively conversant than our poet a sketch or plan from his hand on the subjects of history and on those which belong to it might have taught succeeding ages how to conduct these important researches with national advantage and like some wand of divination it might have pointed to beds where sovereign gold doth grow dryden footnote i have seen a transcript by the favour of a gentleman who sent it to me of gray's directions for heading history it had its merit at a time when our best histories had not been published but it is entirely superseded by the admirable méthode of l'anglais du fresnoy end of footnote i suspect that i could point out the place in which these precious folia sibylli of gray's lie interred they would no doubt be found among other sibylline leaves of mason in two large boxes which he left to the care of his executors these gentlemen as i am informed are so extremely careful of them as to have intrepidly resisted the importunity of some lovers of literature whose curiosity has been aroused by the secreted treasures it is a misfortune which has frequently attended this sort of bequests of literary men that they have left their manuscripts like their household furniture and in several cases we find that many legatees conceive that all manuscripts are either to be burnt like obsolete receipts or to be nailed down in a box that they may not stir a lawsuit in a manuscript note of the times i find that sir richard baker the author of a chronicle formerly the most popular one died in the fleet and that his son-in-law who had all his papers burnt them for waste paper and he said that he thought sir richard's life was among them an autobiography of those days which we should now highly prize among these mutilators of manuscripts we cannot too strongly remonstrate with those who have the care of the works of others and convert them into a vehicle for their own particular purposes even when they run directly counter to the knowledge and opinions of the original writer hard was the fate of honest anthony wood when dr fell undertook to have his history of oxford translated into latin the translator a sullen dogged fellow when he observed that wood was enraged at seeing the perpetual alterations of his copy made to please dr fell delighted to alter it the more while the greater execution supervising the printed sheets by correcting altering or dashing out what he pleased compelled the writer publicly to disavow his own work such i have heard was the case of brian edwards who composed the first accounts of mungo park brian edwards whose personal interests were opposed to the abolishment of the slave trade would not suffer any passage to stand in which the african traveller had expressed his conviction of its inhumanity park among confidential friends frequently complained that his work did not only not contain his opinions but was even interpolated with many which he utterly disclaimed suppressed books become as rare as manuscripts in some researches relating to the history of the mar prelate faction that ardent conspiracy against the established hierarchy and of which the very name is but imperfectly to be traced in our history i discovered that the books and manuscripts of the mar prelates have been too cautiously suppressed or too completely destroyed while those on the other side have been as carefully preserved in our national collection the british museum we find a great deal against mar prelate but not mar prelate himself i have written the history of this conspiracy in the third 
volume of quarrels of authors end of section seventy one